Welcome to Australia Us. I'm Adam McArdle. Today we're meeting with Lisa Tesh, the member for Gosford. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we live, work and play in Dakajung country. We acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. Welcome, Liesl. Thank you for coming. Oh, I'm so excited. This is so extravagant. <laughs> well, we, we want the people of the Central Coast and, and regional Australia to sort of understand and have a voice. So that's what Australia Arts is all about. Absolutely. I'm right beside you. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so thank you for coming today. Um, I, I thought we'd try and get into a little bit of your life first before we jump into all the politics and stuff. So where are you from? Oh, it's a bit of a story. I love the peninsula. I was born in Brisbane, grew up off the grid in a caravan that my dad made in New Zealand till yep. we were seven, seven, and then moved to Lake Macquarie and lived in my godfather's boat shed on the waterfront of Lake Macquarie and then a series of rented properties around the shores of Lake Macquarie while I went through school and then university, then a targeted teaching position in Western Sydney. Um, between Barcelona, Atlanta, the Paralympics, whilst I was training down there. Then a transfer, to, I lived at Womberall and taught at Berkeley Vale, and then was offered to go and play wheelchair basketball professionally in the men's league in Europe, lived in Spain, Italy and France, and was offered a job at Woi Woi, and here I am. You've been everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned Dad. So what, what did Mum and Dad do? Uh, Dad was an architect, but he didn't like to work for the capitalist environment. He worked off the grid, as I said, we, in a caravan that Dad made. But Dad designed sustainable housing, housing in the side of hills orientated towards the, the north for the sunlight. And also, I've got cases full of designs of tiny homes. So Dad operated way ahead of his time, oh, that, I think. That is decades and decades ahead of his time. Way ahead of his time. And also, I mean, he designed the car park and Bolton Street up in Newcastle. He did lots of big design work as well when he used to work for money. Um, yeah. uh, but no, he's an architect. Mum was a potter, first and foremost a potter, and also worked as an aged care nurse. Okay. Yeah. So um, both very creative sort of people. Yeah, yeah, I feel so privileged to be, yeah, the child of, of really creative people. And I think it's also really important that we hold on to our creativity and have time for our crea yeah, creativity. Yeah, I, I agree. So yeah. um, uh, in this day and age, we're all busy, busy, busy doing work. But having that creativity and that time and, and expression Absolutely, and also the joys that the creatives bring to us and even having time to participate and spend time with people who are creative is so important and making sure our community's got the opportunity for people to participate. The creatives are a resource to be able to deliver but also the community has got the spaces to participate and interact with the arts is so important to me. Uh, any siblings? A younger sister, a beautiful younger sister. She's a theatre nurse, lives up in Newcastle. Absolutely fantastic. Speaks to her on the phone this morning before work. We speak nearly every day. She's wonderful, Trudy. So schooling, how, how was schooling for you? Mm, so in New Zealand, we didn't really go to school. <laughs> oh, really? Homeschool? Non-school? Uh, loose, <laughs> le, probably no, none of those formal arrangements. No, there was a school in the, like we lived down at the beach and the school was quite a few miles away. There was a little bit of school, but we didn't go to school very often at all. Um, and so I really started schooling when I moved to Australia when I was seven. And that was a year at Toronto Public School and then three years at St Joseph's Primary at Toronto and then Tr Tron 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 High Toronto, School, yeah. Toronto High School up in Newcastle and then off to the University of Newcastle, the close to home university where I, I, got a, I started with a law degree which turned into an arts degree, came out with a science degree which I thought was going to be a master's in planning and turned into a diploma in education so that's the so, education, so like flexible, life, you, you went a flexible <laughs> education journey as well. But sometimes that's important. Um, being able to develop and, and change your career is an important thing, especially for the young people in this day and age. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like my childhood wasn't normal, but I think also the fact that we would be then evicted from our houses. So we, I think I lived in 15 houses in 13 years or 13 houses in 15 years, my mum used to remind us. But I think that level of change that I experienced as a childhood made, made changes really easy. Like it wasn't that hard. It was quite daunting to pick up my life and move to play wheelchair basketball professionally in the men's league. Not many people would be that brave, but I mean, taking opportunities because change becomes normal is possibly taking on risks associated with change is just part of my life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, so what was something which uh, was really challenging in your life? I think probably the broken back. I don't know. I was an able-bodied kid. I was a sporty kid who put up my hand to get into every single, every single team to get out of class. Um, and then 
went off and I played rep basketball at school and then at uni I sailed every afternoon on Lake Macquarie as a kid as well but went off to uni two days after my last exam I was riding my mountain bike home from a friend's place swerved over the wrong side of the road my bike hit the gutter I somersaulted over the handlebars and fell they think about three meters onto concrete in a driveway that was parallel to the road and I was found by an old lady, sorry, a senior, um, who, whose daughter lived over the road who was home. And she said to me, is there any tingling in your hands or feet? So I was identified as a spinal cord injury straight away. So I woke up, I heli I got new ambulance to Newcastle Hospital, helicoptered to Prince Henry in Sydney with a big operation to take the fragments of bone out of my spinal cord and woke up about two weeks later to be told I was never gonna walk again. So that's probably not, and I, that's a big challenge. Yeah. So, so what? So when we spoke to K. Scott, we were talking about um, boxes quite often. The hardest part is when you get knocked down, getting up again. How do you get back from that? What was the process for you to get mentally back on top of things? Yeah, it was interesting. Like I had, I think the support that wrapped around me from Newcastle to Prince Henry Hospital, which is a huge, like it's a three hour journey plus on public transport. But my mates from uni and my friends and my family were there wrapped around me. And for me, it was never gonna be I wasn't going to be broke. I, I don't know. There wasn't a time where I was actually going to be broken by it. And then I think whilst I was, I had to spend two months lying flat on my back in bed. But while I was in bed, two buff athletes came and said, would you like to try wheelchair basketball? And it's like, oh yeah, like it's, life's going to go on. It wasn't going to stop me. And I think another time, I think a lot of the time I actually think I could be dead. If this was another country and we didn't have our health system, I couldn't participate the way that I can and I'd possibly be dead. So I'm pretty lucky that I live in Australia. Back in 88 was when my injury was. I mean, nobody ever knew what a Paralympic was and it was really the start of disability inclusion. So I've really been also privileged to live in a time where we are included and my work is to get us more included. But yeah, I just, there was never a time where I was going to be knocked down by it. It's just, just a thing that happened to me. I just got to get on. Very good. Yeah. So, so that, that was a big down, but have you had any super highs? So what's something which is the best thing that's ever happened? It gives me a warm glow. The gold medal at the London 2012 Paralympic Games. Like I competed at five Paralympics as a basketballer. We came seventh, fourth, silver, silver, bronze. And then I changed sports after doing the Sydney to Hobart and sailed in London with Dan Fitzgibbon, who's this, just an awesome sailor who dragged this athlete along on the front of the boat trimming the sails. And we won gold. And like that was something that I've been chasing for 20 years. So that bit of medal wrapped around my neck was amazing. And to add to that though, my mum had cancer in the lead up to the Paralympics. And so we had this family discussion, do I go, don't I go? But parents want their kids to live their best dream. And I had the sports psych racked around us and that I was going to sail the last race and fly home. And after the first day of racing, I'd done the ice bath and I was in bed with a hot water bottle trying to get warm again. And the phone rang and it was my sister to say that mum had passed away. So on that very first day of racing at those games, I lost my mum and so Dan found me crying on the stairs and on the iPad to my family and said, Tashi, I get that it's over. And I said, Fitzy, like all mum wants me to do is have the best race, the best Paralympics I possibly can. I can't do anything to help at home. And we put off her celebration of her life till I got home. So that was like, it's just having done that on the back of mum's death, knowing that all your parents have wanted as your kid to do the best thing. It's just, it's, it's almost doubly magic. Yeah, so, and backed it up again with the Goldie and Rio, but that one's seriously not as significant as that first one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a thing um, to be able to fulfill your parents' dreams and make them proud. You yeah, know. and it's interesting, and both of them are past now, so they've never seen the political side of the journey. But I know they'd be proud of me. <laughs> and even, <laughs> even when we're cleaning up the house when mum eventually passed away, the number of letters, like I wish I kept the letters that my parents had written to politicians. They were really... Well thought out and structured. Well thought out, but also they were like, not many people write letters to the government all that often, but mum and dad, they were incessant writers about human justice and rights and what they believed in the environment, what they thought was fair. Yeah. So yeah, but I didn't keep that collection, damn it. Oh, it's a shame, yeah. So the, being able to win that gold medal was such an amazing thing. And we're here at Gossett Sailing Club. So I'm guessing um, a Gossett Sailing Club's a big part of that. You know, did you start your sailing here or have you, do you sail here very often? I've, I've done a bit of sailing here. I'm really passionate. Sailing takes quite a long time. 
and in this life you don't have quite a long time no so I've done a little bit of sailing here but I sailed out of Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club which is where Dan lives he's a quadriplegic who was living in Brisbane but actually looked at the, the history of success around Australia in sailing and the most gold medalists have come out of RPA yeah. so I just used to traverse down there for training I also did a whole bunch of sailing on Lake Macquarie but the Gosford Sailing Club my partner sails that boat over there every single weekend during summer <laughs> and I've come here and it's actually really lovely I come here as a partner of a sailor on awards night not even the member of parliament so it's a beautiful community yeah. and definitely something I'm really connected to. I, I love coming here this is a place where I bring family and friends and it's just nice to have a nice meal or a drink with a beautiful view and it's so relaxed. It's, it's beautiful plus I've done an amazing job we had an awards night with I think 85 female sailors so the She Sails program has been so successful here and it makes me really proud of what women can do out there on the water and as a result of the education program there's a whole bunch of female boat owners like a, a disproportionately growing number of female boat owners which has oh, made <laughs> us a winning sailing club. <laughs> Very good.